गुड इवनिंग okay so everybody please settle down we are, we'll, we we uh, we are about to start our cme okay so uh, a very good evening to all the delegates myself dr sachin choudhary from medical affairs team alkem would like to welcome you all for this scientific activity now talking about the alkem as you know the alkem is one of the leading pharmaceutical company in india since five decades by bringing new innovations and medications our mission is to provide the high quality healthcare products and services to the people around the world along with that we also believe that updating the knowledge of healthcare professionals about the current clinical practice is an important part of health services so to continue our efforts today we brings to you a master class by an experts with the help with the name of taximo trust cme so this master call this master class will provide healthcare professionals with high quality relevant an updated information which will enhance their knowledge and skill which will eventually improve the patient outcome so to begin with uh, let's bring the warmth and positivity around us so i would like to invite dr amrekar sir and our senior leaders for the lamp lighting ceremony now i would like to uh, invite dr sanjeev khosla sir who is a moderator of today's session 
So I request uh, Dr. Khosla sir to please introduce uh, our today's speaker. Good evening, friends and colleagues, not only from Mumbai, but uh, from multiple cities across India. I must congratulate at the onset, uh, Alkem, for beautiful uh, setup of uh, multi-centric CME, which we have now started today. And uh, there could not be a better start than having our esteemed teacher, to begin this masterclass for us on behalf of LCAM. Friends, uh, practice, practice has changed has a lot. Been... Yet, many of us need to go back to basics. Many of us need to understand that clinical examination is one of the most important examinations in our practice. However, with a lot of stress, a lot of pressure, from various industries and various other things, our acumen has not grown as it should have. And there are very few teachers who talk on clinical diagnosis. Most of us look at investigations and investigations as an integral and important part of our practice. However, that is really a sad situation because the basic of clinical examination will help us to understand the patient better and come to a better diagnosis and reduce polytherapy. Friends, with this brief introduction, I would like to feel, I feel privileged that today we have our legendary speaker, uh, person who is known for his clinical acumen and who teaches our clinical diagnosis, which we can do in our clinic or bedside and come to a conclusion almost accurately. His principle that common problems should be thought commonly and rare problems should be thought rarely is one of the most important principles we should imbibe because he says that you will rarely make a mistake. So such a teacher, I feel we are all blessed today evening to have amongst us. And he has been a teacher for more than five and a half decades. We have people who have learned and become super doctors in India, all across India, because he has taught them the basics which they have imbibed and use in their practice. Friends, I uh, feel honored and I request all of you to give a warm welcome to our speaker, Dr. Y.K. Amdekar. And I request him to please come on stage and start today's session. This session, I am sure, will give us a lot of messages to take home. And today, we will become better doctors than we were yesterday. Thank you, friends. Thank you so much, sir. So before uh, sir's talk, actually, uh, I would request our senior members from Alkem to please come forward. And I request uh, them to please felicitate Dr. Amdekar, sir, and ma'am. Sir. Wait, wait, sir, wait, wait. <laughs> yeah. I also request Mrs. Amdekar, ma'am, to please.
Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Rana Bosa. And uh, yeah, also uh, I I would I would request uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Agrawal from GP Clinic to please felicitate uh, Dr. Amrekar sir. I also request Mrs. Amdekar ma'am to please come on the stage. Dr. Agarwal want to felicitate you. Thank you, thank you everyone. So uh, before the start of session, I'll just quickly brief about today's program. So basically it's a live CME based interactive sessions. It will be live streamed to 11 different, different location across the India. Uh, during search talk, sir will be asking few questions and you need to scan the code which is provided to you so that you can provide your answers to the polling. And uh, with that, without wasting much of your time, I request uh, Dr. Amrekar sir to please come on the dais and start his session. He will be talking upon a very interesting topic that is differential diagnosis of fever. So, sir, stage is all yours. Thank you so much. Good evening, friends. First thing I must make clear that I'm not here to teach any one of you. I'm sure all of us have learned by our own selves. And this is just to make you understand that even what Dr. Kosla said, whatever advances have occurred still, there is no replacement for a basic clinical medicine. It's far more important for family physicians because you will see a patient on day one or hour one when there is nothing to look at. And you will have to decide whether that child or that person is going to get more sick or get all right without doing anything. Not an easy job at all. As a consultant, when I have enough time to see what has happened all over and I have a lot of investigations, at the end of it also, I label a diagnosis, but often there is no treatment. So keeping this in mind, today's session is just to sensitize you how as early as day one, day two of a child or an adult for that matter coming with fever, how can you take that decision? Whether to treat him, whether to watch him, whether to hospitalize him, all that. And it's going to be interactive. I said that we will have four options. There would be A, B, C, D, and you will just choose your option and we will decide uh, on the merits of our discussion how best we could have done on that. But before doing all that, let's get to the basics. And we must know why fever comes. Unless we know that. And I, I must tell you that even the today's undergraduate student does not get trained on this. And you and me also were not trained. We did not know why fever comes. But we know fever comes. Okay. Fever comes as a result of tissue damage. Any tissue that gets damaged, the body responds by producing chemicals, which are called cytokines, and then that causes fever. So fever is a response of the body to tissue damage, and it's implemented through a temperature regulating system, where a hypothalamus is the point in charge, it decides how high the fever should be. And the peripheral autonomic nervous system decides how to reach that temperature and how to cool. So you can understand that you have to have a tissue damage, you have to have a person who can mount an immune response, then the message should go to hypothalamus. Hypothalamus decides how high the fever should be. And once that is attained, the job is done and when the job is no longer necessary, the autonomic nervous system cools your body down and you're all right. Once you understand this very much, that means 
hypothalamus is a set point, like your air conditioner or whatever. You set it, and you like it or not, it will reach there. Once you set it, you have no choice. So when the body's immune system sets it to 104, you do what you like, it will reach 104 because you have set up it. Now this is important to know. And once the fever attains a peak, then only it may come down or it may remain there. Now what is the importance? If you give your antipyretic before the hypothalamic set point is reached, the antipyretic will not work. And then many times you must have heard, oh, paracetamol doesn't work, so you must give higher one. There is no higher one. Then you give a combination of the two. That also doesn't work because you have set it. The hypothalamus is set. So what's the point to understand out of this? We need to tell the parents when to take antipyretic. But I'm sure we have never been trained on this. Therefore, we say, many of them say, uh, up to 100, give this. Then between 100 and 102, give this, which is nonsense. Now, how will we know that the peak has been attained? And I think that is what we are going to learn today. That to guess that this is the peak now, and at that point, you give whatever antipyretic you want. In children, it's easy. Because when the peak is attained, most of the children are either lethargic or irritable. And if they are not, then you don't need to give an antipyretic. Most of the mothers have told you that, oh, even in fever, my child plays. What does it mean? The child is trying to tell the mother and the physician that I don't need any antipyretic. But you have never told your patients about it at all, so they go on giving it. And when before the hypothalamic set point is reached, you have already given it, then you get a phone call, hour has passed, fever has not come down, it's rising. So you say, you repeat it again, that means you are causing toxicity. How important this point is, I'm sure I had never learned myself, and I'm sure most of you must not have learned this. But this is very, very important. And then fever may come down quickly by sweating, if the body feels, no, now it's not necessary 104, bring it down fast. You sweat. That's what happens classically in a malarial fever. Or it may come down slowly by itself, or it may come down because you give an antipyretic. Now, once you understand this, the question is, is fever a friend or a foe? What does, why does the fever come at all? The body senses there is a tissue damage. So now the hypothalamus sets a point. Why fever? Because then the site of disease, the site of tissue damage gets more blood supply and through blood supply, more soldiers come to contain the problem and heal it and then go away. So when, when the police station gets a phone call, girl, there is a riot there, they send the policemen so that they contain the problem and when the problem is solved, they come back. The blood circulation increases, gets to the site. You have antibodies, you have cells, you have soldiers. They go and attack the site, contain the problem, heal the problem, and then get away. So fever is a friend. Then should we not treat fever? No, so we should never treat fever. We should treat discomfort caused by fever. If I can tolerate my fever, it's for good, and I'm not suffering. So again, paracetamol is to be given not because I have fever, but because I cannot tolerate fever. You are told in a rainy season, uh, tap water is not safe, you boil water. But do you drink a boiling water? No. You boil water and allow it to cool and then drink. Okay, and therefore, I thought this is very, very important for a rational practice. So try to tell the parents, try to tell the patients when to take paracetamol. And because we have never learned this, because we have never told to the parents, we have combination antipyretics, which is nonsense. Okay. So 
this was very very important and now my next slide is an interaction slide so you could now kind of <clears throat> vote on this now fever may be due to infection non infective inflammation non inflammatory disorders or all of the above your time starts now excellent see how we have started so well majority of you said all of the above which means every time i see a patient of fever it could be infection it could be non infective inflammation or it could be not even an inflammation you all might have seen such patients like a thyrotoxicosis coming with fever then heat fever then central fever we talk about the temperature regulating system if i have a hypothalamic tumor i may come to you only with fever or if i have an autonomic nervous system not working well i may come only with fever and imagine now fever could be any one of those and every time you see a child with fever or a patient with fever you will have to decide which one of these categories you are talking about but the symptomatic treatment remains the same we have said we will treat discomfort if any but not the degree of fever so we are clear about it i think let's get to the next slide please can we get out of this yes now what is the first thing that you do when you see a patient of any age coming for anything but we are talk we are talking about fever what's the first thing you do when patient walks in your thing first of all we have to see, see the looks of the patient uh very good <clears throat> tell us why, why are you looking at how beautiful that mother is no 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 <clears throat> on looks we can decide whether he is serious or not uh, whether he is uh, he is in discomfort or in comfort or he is toxic or not he is uh, uh, um, brain having brain and problem or he is having uh, this uh, uh, physical problem excellent excellent anyone wants to add anything more <clears throat> what he says is appearance tells him how serious the patient is that's what he meant and let's and uh, uh, accompanying symptoms what the patient has that is very important what he has and therefore the first thing that you want to do is you want to be sure is this person serious many times the parents may not know the child is serious or even an adult may not know he is serious and how can you do that in 30 seconds a quick look and i think once you start practicing i'm sure that the cid can look around and decide the on the railway platform the tc knows whom to ask for the pass or a ticket because he has an eye to pick up abnormality right we must do that <clears throat> and how do we do that quick assessment in 30 seconds watch for red flags what are red flags he talked about the behavior what behavior lethargy irritability disoriented irrelevant talk very important i recall a 10 year old child with pneumonia in my ward at jj hospital fever had come down but when i was taking round my registrar said sir the child is better the mother said no sir i don't like the look of the child she is talking about the look of the child i said what's happening so i went near the child and asked him where is your mother he was searching where the mother was he had confusion what was the cause he was hypoxia he needed oxygen but not an antibiotic or upgrading antibiotic behavior anyone who is looking lethargic irritable disoriented talking irrelevantly i'm sure all of you must have seen typhoid which possibly earlier days was so common and there would be an irrelevant talk you would say a person is looking toxic ill now that is the behavior besides that 
you look at the air well because he has to be all right if he's getting oxygen well and you have to see that airway is patent and there is no sound coming like a grunt <gasps> Uh, uh, that is a grunt. Almost diagnosed pneumonia straight off. How simple. Just looking at that, looking at that sound. Or a wheezing, asthma. Or an inspiratory strider. <gasps> oh, you have a laryngitis or a croup. <clears throat> the airway sound tells you the diagnosis straight off. Oh, this person is serious. We must to run about. Same way the cardiac things. So look at tachypnea, look at tachycardia. Okay. Earlier days, the Vaid used to diagnose with pulse. We were wondering, how can he diagnose with pulse? No, he was looking at the pulse and respiration as a monitor of how serious the person is and whether he is improving. When did we last check the pulse of our patient? We had no time. We knew he was alive, so why look at the pulse? Tachycardia, tachypnea is so important. And if you have a disproportionate tachycardia, I recall a child who's a, whose surgeon had operated a young adult with an appendicitis, and the surgery went well. But two days later, the relations told me, Ki, Sir, would you talk to the surgeon? To me, the patient is not looking well. So the surgeon said, sir, there is no guarding, no rigidity, no fever. But there was a marked tachycardia and he was in shock, septic shock. He was in shock, so he had no fever, but he was looking not well to the relatives. Relatives understand, so why should we not understand? Behavior is so important, tachycardia, tachypnea. And does the skin rash worry you? Skin rash is so common, no? Viral infection. Would it worry you? There are there may be many diseases with skin that says uh, uh, in flu uh, in uh, viral fever, fever also in uh, uh, measles in uh, uh, that's right and there were the type of rash a purpuric rash gangrenous rash oh serious. Whatever the person is, you need to rush him to the hospital. So, so important. So, the point I'm making is, first make sure that a person coming with fever is not serious. And we will see all those patients as we go further on that. But this is very, very important. And I think before we start discussing the cases, I want to give you a simple clinical approach. If you ask me which book has given us, I don't think any book has given this. And I'm sure all of you, quite a few of you are very senior, have learned some tricks of the trade without looking at the book. Okay. And there may not be evidence, but today we are looking for an evidence of what we are saying. And we have already last uh, almost six months, we are doing a multicentric trial on this kind of a simple way of diagnosing cause of fever in the first two, three days. So take a note of this. Okay, most important is the degree of fever at onset. I want to know every time when a person comes with fever, he says, last three days I have fever. You tell me whether the on day one, first 12, 24 hours, how high was the fever? He said, no, the fever was very high. High fever means more cytokines. More cytokines means more damage. And therefore, this person must have had more damage. What is more damage? A severe pus-forming inflammatory lesion, like a tonsillitis or a urinary tract infection. One spot with a severe damage is a big damage. Or a viral infection, small damage but all over. I have a body ache, headache, cold, cough, one vomit, one loose stool. Everywhere a bit of damage became a big damage and therefore an acute viral infection acute bacterial infections, and even non-infective inflammatory disorders like rheumatological disorders, like malignancies, they all come with high fever, like malaria. Suddenly the parasites come into the bloodstream and you get a high fever. So high fever means there is a high tissue damage. 
either small damage everywhere. Suppose several police stations get a phone call that there is small riots everywhere. Oh, it's all over. Damage is severe. Or one police station in their area get, oh, there is too much of riots going on. That's also severe. Severe could be at one place, a bacterial infection. Severe could be at small degree, multiple places. Again, severe, a viral infection. So take a note of all this. And therefore, when a bacterial infection comes in, you have two types of bacterial infections. One, where the organism settles straight into the area, like tonsils, or like urinary tract, or like a bacillary dysentery. Organism goes straight into the intestine and starts. But meningitis, for example, it can't go straight there. So first it goes through the bloodstream and then to that. So two types of bacterial infection, a bacteremic bacterial infection and a bacterial infection at the site. At the site starts with high fever. And if it's a bacteremic, the fever is moderate, but after two, three days become high. That's what happens in typhoid, a step ladder pattern of fever. How important it is to ask, how was the degree of fever on day one, day two, day three? And you will get some idea about it. The next is response. If a person does not respond to antipyretic, I talk about paracetamol because I have never used anything other than paracetamol. Paracetamol is the safest and a fairly wide spectrum of safety. I have never required another one. Why? Because we must know when to give it rather than change the antipyretic. And therefore, we know now, we have said when to give it. Now, even when I gave it the right dose, single dose is 15 milligram per kilogram for a child, and if there is no response whatsoever, then I'm a little worried. Often it could be a very toxic bacterial infection. So next question you ask is, what is the response? And the mother would say, oh, fever comes down a little. Oh, then I'm all right. But poor response might mean you are something else. Most important part of this story is an interfebrile period. And every time I've asked the mother, she says, sir, 103 fever ho jata hai. I said, what do you do? Oh, I give paracetamol. Then what happens? In 20 to 30 minutes, the fever comes down a little. Fever is still high. But the child is playful. When interfebrile period is not sick, you are not in an emergency and very likely you don't need an antibiotic. So simple. 95 to 99% the statements will be right. No statement is right in medicine just to be sure every time. No. But if you are 95, 98% right, then I think you have done wonderful well. Interfebrile period, normal. And what is interfebrile period? High fever at whatever. You give paracetamol. 104 becomes 102. But the child changes his attitude. Behavior is changed. He likes to watch TV. He likes to eat a little. He wants to play. You have no reason to start an antibiotic at all. Right on day one. How important is this statement? What about rhythm? That's the next important thing. Most of the bacterial and viral infections are rhythmic, which means as soon as paracetamol effect goes away, the fever comes again. So every four to six hours fever is mostly acute bacterial or acute viral. And we already said viral interfebrile period is normal. So we easily get to know that. But if the rhythm is erratic, Sir, sometimes it becomes 104, but next day there was hardly any fever. Malaria is an erratic fever. And there is another type of a rhythm. Sir, fever comes only twice in 24 hours. Now, no, no antipyretic works for 12 hours. So it means the disease itself has that kind of a rhythm. And that is almost always an immunological disorder, not infective. Like a rheumatological disorder. Okay, so we will see the effect of all this. Take a note of the, all these factors. And the last is, what is the progress on day three, day four? By the first three, four points, you are almost suspecting right on day one what kind of fever it is. By day two, you are more certain. 
by day three, day four, either he is better, that's a viral infection, or you made a mistake, he is getting worse, or that could be a bacterial infection, or he has remained the same, that is mostly non-infective inflammatory disorder. If you keep these points in mind, and then, like what Dr. Kosla said, the last is, which is the accompanying symptoms that you have. If somebody comes to me right on first day and says, oh, I have high fever, but all running nose and cough, and I know the symptoms, I know respiratory, <clears throat> I know mostly viral. So, if you keep this in mind now, while we discuss cases, I will show you that you will be able to suspect your diagnosis on day one, almost be sure on day two. By day three, you are very sure this is the problem. What else do you want in patients who come to you very early? I think the challenge is on your side because you see meningitis on day one. When there is no neck rigidity, there is no headache, there is no vomiting. How will you suspect meningitis on day one? You can't suspect meningitis on day one, but you have suspected it's a bacterial infection. And what a common bacterial infection, if it's tonsillitis, I see. Okay, if it's absolutely dysentery, I know symptoms. If I have no symptoms on the first day of a bacterial infection, I have either a urinary tract infection where the symptoms are hidden or I'm going to get pneumonia or a meningitis. So simple. So on day one, you can suspect a bacterial infection. On day two, he said, I had a one or two vomits and I'm getting little headache. Oh, I'm getting meningitis. Other fellow will say, I've started cough a little and I feel a bit breathless. So he was getting pneumonia. On day two, you can get to the system involved. On day three, you have signs. Signs come on day three, suspicion on day one, and almost near certain on day two. How important all this. Having done all this, contact history is also important. Today, today we are all used to COVID, contact this, that, that. So I'm sure we know all that. <clears throat> now, with this background, <clears throat> I'm going to show you seven, eight common cases that you and me will see right on day one, day two, day three. And I have one or two cases where somebody comes after a week. Even if he comes after a week, ask him how was he in the first two, three days. And today, when I see a PUO, sir, last two months I'm getting fever. Then on two months, he has got multiple antibiotics, multiple drugs. What history I want to know? I want to know the history of first two, three days. And keep this in mind. Let's start now cases and you will vote everywhere. This is that. <clears throat> Look at this. Young, healthy adult woke up from sleep at 4 a.m. with high fever, 104 that did not respond to antipyretic. By 8 o'clock, he was found talking irrelevantly and family physician was called. Look at each point. We have discussed some of these points. <clears throat> you start looking at fever. Is it infection? Non-infection. That's the first thing. And if it's infection, bacterial or viral. And before that, is it serious or not serious? Right? So, just look at all this correctly. And physical examination, he was looking sick. <clears throat> and he had just developed some macular, macular petechial rash. All this happens in four hours' time. Okay. Now your options are rush him to the hospital, give intramuscular paracetamol sponging, shift to the hospital by doing that, or even give ceftriaxone, paracetamol, and shift to the hospital. Your time starts now. <clears throat> Good. <clears throat> Most of you voted that you must rush him to the hospital. Very good. You looked at it. Can we get to the slide? <clears throat> See, you know he was serious. Okay. So he has to get to the hospital. But when you know he is serious and you have to get to the hospital, you have to reach him safely to the hospital. So you could do some first aid at that time. <clears throat> okay. So what first aid? You want to give some paracetamol or sponging, whatever, fine. 
but the question is is this a bacterial infection or a viral infection or no infection what do you think this might be a viral infection okay uh, all right anyone who wants to call it non infective or a bacterial infection <clears throat> Now, why do you say it's a bacterial? As the patient is not responding to paracetamol. Look at that. We said that a typical bacterial infection may not respond to even antipyretic. Okay. It's a bacterial infection. Okay. What else did you know? That it's fastly progressing. He's deteriorating very fast. What is irrelevant talk? Patichal, patichal, patichal skin eruptions. That goes in favor of probably meningitis. Excellent. <clears throat> Give him a clap. He said that irrelevant talk means the brain is getting involved. Okay. That's why he's talking irrelevantly. And therefore, this is going to be an intracranial bacterial infection. If this is so, you may not be wrong to give oneself triaxone also before he reaches the hospital because when he reaches the hospital it takes another one hour before the doctor sees or some action is taken but the point I want to make is that just by the word four lines you could pick up seriousness, you could pick up acute bacterial infection, you could pick up an infection that's bothering the brain, so you call it meningitis or whatever and this was a meningococcemia, something that can kill a person in 12 hours time. If this person was just sent, okay, he's talking because he has high fever, I'll give something, let's wait, you come by evening, he may not be there in the evening. <clears throat> meningococcemia is a very dangerous infection. But the point is, this is exactly, then normally what happens is, no, but he was otherwise all right. He suddenly died. Nobody dies suddenly, especially with fever. You may die suddenly with a myocardial infarct or whatever, but if fever doesn't cause sudden death, there are warnings, but we don't pick up the warning, right? Let's see the next case. <clears throat> Four-year-old presented with high fever, cold and cough for two days. There was a poor response to paracetamol. He was sick in the interfebrile period. But past history, he had recurrent cold and cough. There is also family history of atopy. Take a note of every small thing that I've already said, and now you are used to all that. Your options are symptomatic therapy, in addition to CBC, CRP, in addition give amoxiclav, or give also cough syrup. Your time starts now. <coughs> Good. Uh, good number, 40 plus. Want CBC, CRP, and then take a call. And another 40% wants to give amoxiclav and cough syrup. Now, who wanted to do CBC, CRP, and then take a call? Anyone? Anyone who had voted, please tell us why you did that. It doesn't matter. See, <clears throat> At the end of 55 years of pediatrics, when I teach postgraduates, I often make mistakes. Hello. And I tell the parents, students that I'm not ashamed because I have made you learn that even at the end of all that, I make mistakes. So if you make mistakes, where is the problem? So because there is history of recurrent cold and cough. Okay. Because yeah, there is history of recurrent cold and cough. So that's why you wanted CBC, CRP? So, do you think CBC CRP will help you? Yeah, might be. Fine. Yeah. So, we will learn about that. Uh, 
uh, in today's time, we have seen viral infection getting very, very uh, uh, volatile and we see the high CRP is an indication that there is a severe inflammation, maybe because it is viral, but there is a severe inflammation, which is a red flag sign. Okay. Now, who, who wanted amoxiclav and cough syrup? Yeah, please. So please tell us why did you choose? Sir, it does not respond to paracetamol. So probably it is bacterial and definitely is having fever and cough, cold. So cough syrup may be added. Very good. So I'm, I'm happy that each one of you, see, what's the advantage of an interactive session is everybody starts thinking. And sir, CRP is not a good idea of doing in fever. CRP is now misused like anything. So I don't think in any infection it will rise. So it's not a sensible. Agreed, agreed. The point is <clears throat> that dengue is a viral infection. Till he gets into shock, he is not going to be sick into febrile. Okay. So these are the rules. See, medicine is full of exceptions. But exception means the rule exists and majority follow the rules. Okay. So... I'm sure that what I'm saying is never 100% right, but mostly right. And today in medicine, we can be only mostly right. We can never be 100% right. So the point to make is that, uh, which cough syrups do you use, sir? You said amoxiclavius, I understood. Huh? Cough syrup. The point is that a pharmacologist tell me there is no cough syrup at all. But I'm sure all of us have to write some cough syrup. So we will discuss when the time comes. So the point is, this child had obviously an acute bacterial URTI with a background of allergy. And therefore, once his infection is controlled, you will have to look at why he's getting repeated cold and cough. There is a family history of atopia also. So he may need some treatment for recurrent respiratory allergy. Right? Good. So let's get to the third case. Uh, this is a young adult presented with high fever and headache <clears throat> for two days. Both symptoms temporarily improved with paracetamol, but recurred every six hours with occasional vomiting. Take a note of all this correctly. Now, physical examination, NAD. Okay, he is very comfortable during interfebrile period. Now, what is NAD? You know NAD? Nothing abnormal, detected. Nothing abnormal detected, but NAD is also is not actually done. Physical examination, NAD, not actually done. Okay, chalo. <clears throat> okay, so, but the point is, yes, physical examination is normal. Now your options are continue paracetamol and observe, upgrade antibiotic, pyretic, give combination drugs, in addition to a CBC or suggest hospitalization. Your time starts now. <clears throat> Excellent. Majority of you feel that we should just watch. Now, who would tell me why do you want to watch? The fellow has headache and the fellow has also one vomit. Are you not worried about intracranial problem? So occasional few patients do have vomit along with fever, occasional. Fine. And therefore, what he meant was that, let him have fever and headache. But when you give paracetamol, both temporarily come down. If he had a meningitis, fever may have come down, but the headache would not have come down because headache is due to increased intracranial tension. And one vomit, anybody who is sick vomits once in a while. So this child has simply a viral infection in spite of headache, vomiting, etc., you are not worried. And you would say that wait for a day or two, mostly will be all right. Again, a good, good thought by this. Let's get to the slide. <coughs> Let's get to the fourth. 15-year-old presented with fever, cold, cough for three days. High fever at onset, fair response to paracetamol, Normal during interfebrile period, rhythmic fever every six hours, recovered on day four without any therapy, but fever recurred after 24 hours. You rightly waited in the first three, four days and say, no, looks like viral, don't worry. And you are right. So pa patient is happy. 
बट नेक्स्ट डे ये कम्स एंड से सर बुखार फिर आ गया ओके फीवर इज रिकॉर्ड नॉट हाई फिजिकल एग्जामिनेशन इज नॉर्मल योर ऑप्शन आर वेट एंड वॉच इन एडिशन टू सम टेस्ट इन एडिशन स्टार्ट एन एंटीबायोटिक और शिफ्ट इम टू द हॉस्पिटल योर टाइम स्टार्ट ना हो very good most of you like to kind of do some tests but i will show you how the tests are mostly useless <clears throat> i am exaggerating okay only to tell you that if you do test in time one or two times you might find something otherwise you will always find something that has no relevance at all and we will do that a little later on this so but therefore that may not be the answer but that b option also said don't be in a hurry to treat so i suppose those who have voted for it also wants to wait and watch but make sure that there is nothing else okay so why do you want to wait and watch uh, many of the viral fevers are biphasic fever the viral fevers are biphasic okay and therefore you wait for a while so you are right and therefore you have waited but let's see the next the, back to the slides so by phasic fever due to viral infection second phase was for it and small but you don't know how small it is going to be because patient has just come to you saying that aur subah se fir bukhar aaya so you will have to be careful let's look at the next layer next patient <clears throat> similar 15 year old presented with fever cold cough for 3 days high fever at onset fair response normal during interfebrile period rhythmic of febrile on day 4 on its own 24 hours later high fever severe abdominal pain and very sick looking okay small difference between the previous one and this one and your options are again similar wait and watch addition to test or give amoxicillin or shift to the hospital your time starts now <laughs> good majority of you want to shift him to the hospital very good would somebody say why after all he has an abdominal pain so you give an antispasmodic Uh, well, uh, this could be a patient uh, having uh, something like dengue. He might be going in shock, so we would uh, not wait for him, and he may require IV fluids, which are very essential. <clears throat> What have we learned? Many viral fevers are biphasic, but the second phase, if it is as bad or worse than the first phase, you have to shift him to the hospital. the previous patient had a small degree of fever you could have waited okay this child also has an additional acute abdominal pain when abdominal pain starts acutely it is always vascular and why vascular in dengue because he is getting into shock so intestines are not getting good perfusion nature is great nature does not mind skin is affected because not even adequate circulation that's why your skin gets cold your peripheral circulation gets a little affected the next organ to be sacrificed is the abdomen because intestines are several feet for a while if they don't get some good amount of perfusion they will not die all of a sudden but the brain cannot sustain even for a minute the lungs can the heart can myocardium can okay to that extent acute abdominal pain in a dengue when he is improving indicates a shock coming and you are right this child required so what have we said recurrent fever is common biphasic but that biphasic second phase you must look carefully and we have clearly said this is a capillary leak dr kosla said this is dengue and this is typically a dengue uh, doing that look at this before and after good isn't it 
the fellow is saying, but now if this happens, sorry, if this happens, no, 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 this is, this is not right. Okay, this is an unanticipated. Beware of unanticipated. Okay. And the child that we discussed just now, 15 year old, unanticipated worsening after recovery from fever. Unanticipated. Anything unanticipated, take a note. What does it mean? A practitioner must have in mind what is anticipated. I'll give you a simple example. A child has diarrhea for two days. Sir, too many loose tool, do something. And you give some medicine and they are so happy. Sir, in the next two hours, diarrhea stopped completely. And they said, Aapka hat lag gaya na? Theek ho gaya. Unanticipated, he has developed an intussusception and an intestinal obstruction. What have we learned? We cannot get anybody quickly better. If he gets quickly better, parents are very happy. Aapka hat lag gaya na? Maine bola na, ye doctor sabse achha hai. What is pity is, they don't even accept our brain. They say, heart lag gaya hai. Okay, you use your brain. So, unanticipated, that is not expected. <clears throat> and we'll go by the next slide. The next case, four-year-old presented with high fever, cold and earache for two days. Good response to paracetamol. Interfebrile period is normal. Physical examination, nothing. Nothing largely because most of us don't peep into the ear. Quite a few pediatricians do that now because people come from abroad and they wonder why you have not checked the ear. So we have learned to peep into the ear. And when you peep into the ear, you also can see something in the ear. Okay, of course you need an otoscope for that. Many pediatricians have now realized to have an otoscope also with us. And therefore, your options are now symptomatic therapy in addition to CBC or also given amoxiclav or it is better you give cefixim. Your time starts now. Very good. Majority of you feel that do nothing. Okay. And you are right. In fact, when we said that this looks like a viral infection, but there is an earache. So earache worries us whether this could be a bacterial infection, then the drum can burst, the pus can flow. That is a worry. But this being a four-year-old child, can we get back to the slide? This is self-limiting viral URTI. Eh? even when there is an earache, and therefore, what have we learned? In this same situation, if the child was under one year, you don't take a chance of missing a bacterial infection, even if you thought it was viral. Because that ear bacterial infection in a younger child might cause meningitis, mastoiditis, brain abscess, any complication. So under one year, you would not have waited. Between two and five, if the earache was very severe, even an analgesic cannot help him, you might not take a chance. But beyond that, you will not worry and not give an antibiotic. What have we learned? Rationality has also limitation. And saving life or saving complications is our job. So you can be a bit irrational <clears throat> when the risk is involved. But the risk is involved only in 5 or 10% of patients. Not every time you say, no, there is a risk, so I want to give some antibiotic, no. But this is the message. In fact, this was made as a rule in United States because of an earache, people used antibiotic and an amoxicillin start, stopped working in US. So they made a rule that by legality, nobody will prescribe an antibiotic unless these situations come. And I think it's a good way to follow that. <clears throat> Young, healthy adult presented with fever for five days. Now in the last two cases, we are taking a little longer fever. <clears throat> Again, telling you that what happens in the first two, three days becomes very important to diagnose. 
no other symptom, moderate fever to begin with, high fever on day three. <clears throat> now, physical examination is looking sick. He has no localizing sign. Your options are observe and do some tests. All the tests as above and start amoxiclav in addition to blood culture or even use cefixim. Your point starts now. <clears throat> Ten minutes more for me. Excellent. Majority of you have said that this fever was moderate and then became high, and the child is sick. So this is a bacteremic bacterial infection. The organisms are entered the bloodstream, and now on day three, day four, they have settled in some other organ. And that is typically a typhoid. What have we learned? The typhoid is best suspected by day three, day four, when there are no clinical signs. There is no splenomegaly, there is no abdominal distension. But a moderate fever getting higher on day three, day four, and a person looking more sick, is typhoid till to prove otherwise? And you can get to send the blood and blood culture also, because today the diagnosis of typhoid is must be done by blood culture, very effective spending money for it, because then you know your diagnosis is right, and today typhoid is often a resistant antibiotic problem, and therefore uh, this was typically, back to the slide, this was typically a typhoid fever, and almost all of you got it. Now this is another child, one year old, small child, high fever for three days, poor response to paracetamol, sick during interfebrile period, no other symptoms. Take a note of all that and physical examination is looking sick, but there are no other findings at all. Your options are wait and watch, do some tests, start a moxiclav or shift to the hospital. Your time starts now. What a wonderful way. See, what has happened? I have not talked to you about anything that is medicine. I have just sensitized your grey cells. And you are coming so well. Then what is the problem with most of us in our clinic? We have no time to think. And here we are sitting thinking. Okay, what I have proved all of you? When you think, you know. Okay, and when you think right, you are almost right, but you think first. Okay, when we don't think, so we many times work at a spinal level. It doesn't go up to cortex. And to go to the cortex, it takes a minute or two to think. Right? And therefore, you are all getting, back to the slide, you are all getting so correctly, this was a urinary tract infection in a young child, often serious, presence almost like sepsis, might have complications, even if he gets better, might have a renal damage. And today, if you see, a large number of people who are on dialysis are about 40, 50 year olds and not very serious, high age people. They must have had some problems in the kidney that has been missed by all of us, and now they are in a dialysis center. So take a note of this UTI, and then let's get to the Next slide. A two-year-old presented with fever and excessive irritability for five days. Take a note. He has gone on for five days. Okay. Little longer than what we are talking so far. But even then, on day five, he has no other symptoms except he has been irritable right from day one. And he has a fair response to paracetamol, but irritability continues. Fever comes down, but the irritability continues. But... There are no other symptoms. Examination doesn't show anything at all. Your options are wait and watch. Do some tests. In addition, start cefixime or suggest hospitalization. Your time starts now.
Good. Majority of said start uh, get to the hospital. Why? Why did you say that? I'm worried about missing something serious here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you are worried about intracranial compartment. Yes. <clears throat> When irritability is there from day one and continues till day five, and there is no other symptom like worsening, like vomiting, like drowsiness, like convulsions, this irritability is not intracranial. That's number one. But your point is right. You started thinking, oh, irritability and fever must be. But when intracranial infection starts with irritability on day one, by day three, day four, he may be dead as well. He will certainly be drowsy, unconscious, seizures, but that has not happened. So he's same. What did we talk in our first slides? When the person remains same for five days, doesn't get better, doesn't get worse without any treatment, then it's likely non-infective. Viral infection get better, bacterial infection not treated get worse, but five days, same thing, no change. Likely, it is a non-infective immunological disorder. <clears throat> and I was just talking to some of you before we started that this is the case that you should not miss. Because that irritability means pain, but not headache, because there is nothing intracranial. So usually severe myalgia or severe bone pain. So this child has got a severe myalgia. For example, Deng is a severe myalgia. Okay. So this child has a severe myalgia, but non-infective because he has gone on for five days, same. So immunological, severe myalgia or a bone pain. And this is very typical of either Kawasaki or a leukemia. You can imagine one can pick up on day four, day five, a suspicion of a leukemia or a suspicion of a Kawasaki disease. Kawasaki is, we do not know exactly why Kawasaki occurs. It's supposed to be triggered by some viral infection, but the science doesn't know it so far. But the problem with Kawasaki is, first four or five days, there is only fever and irritability and nothing else. And no deterioration, no improvement. But the irritability, younger the child, irritability is maximum. I've seen mothers not sleeping for five nights and days because the child doesn't stop crying. He wings for a while and then wakes up and again starts crying. Such a severe irritability in a child with non-infective fever. By another two days, this child will start showing many other signs like mouth becomes red, eyes become red. A lymph node comes here, skin rash comes here, and then you diagnose typically a Kawasaki. But what's important to pick up early is that when this is the story, leukemia can be ruled out simply by doing a CBC. Mostly we will know there will be an anemia or uh, blast cells or thrombocytopenia. You will pick that up. If not, CBC is normal, but this is the story. This child is likely to get a coronary vessel dilatation and will possibly die at the age of 20, 30, 40 of a myocardial infarct. Very soon in the next 10 years, the common cause of myocardial infarct is going to be an acquired cause like a Kawasaki. And we need not miss it, especially typical Kawasaki occurs in young Adults, adolescents are more often in young children, not in old people. And to that extent, immediate hospitalization and IVIG intravenously saves most of the coronary complaints or problems. This is important. This is just to kind of tell you that how you can pick up a non-infective condition and whatever non-infective could be rheumatological malignancy, but one that we should not miss now, and we have started seeing this. So this is important not to miss. Let's get to the last slide, possibly. 18-year-old presented with recurrent fever for the last two months. As I said, that first all slides had patients with two, three, two, three days of fever, and that is what you often see. But a five-day fever also, you looked at what happened in the first two, three days. 
and made a diagnosis of a non-infective fever. Now, this is a person who is getting recurrent fever for last two months, each episode for two to six days with an interval of few days, normal. No other symptoms, routine tests have normal and antibiotics have failed. Okay? What do you find on physical examination? At the end of two months, nothing at all. Take a note of this and your options are now repeat malaria tests and try artimeter, rule out TB with CT chest scan, gene expert, trial with anti-TB drugs with presumptive diagnosis of TB or try long-term anti-inflammatory drug. Your time starts now. Very good. <clears throat> Majority of you feel that two months recurrent fever. Okay. What is TB for us? Fever off and on. This was off and on. But more important was the commonest disease in TB is pulmonary and you start coughing. This child did not have cough. But that doesn't rule out TB. But what is more important in a long drawn fever? How has his health maintained? A child, a person having TB, getting fever off and on for two months, may not show anything else at all, may not have any other symptoms at all, but he is losing weight, he is losing appetite, he is getting tired, he is not normal. If he is same, then again we said, one who remains same is unlikely an infection. And if he is unlikely an infection, it's an immunological disorder. What are two common immunological disorders? One, rheumatological disorders, joint pains, arthritis, skin rash, mouth ulcers. That's rheumatological or malignancy. And the malignancies which come with fever are almost hematological malignancies, leukemia, lymphoma. And to that extent, if this child over two months had not deteriorated, this is known as a periodic fever syndrome. This is immunological. We do not know what sets in. This is not uncommon. I would be saying almost every two weeks, a child who is going on for four months with repeated fever, repeated thing. But what is most important is his weight is fine, his appetite is fine, he is running about fine. Only when he has fever, he sits down. Otherwise, he is fine. It tells you he has remained same. Same means no infection, by and large. And therefore, these, these people just need a long-term anti-inflammatory drug like ibuprofen or better is naproxen. And you give it for two weeks, four weeks, they start getting better. This was just to sensitize you how important it is to look at first two, three days of fever of all kind. I'll just now give you, we talked about CBC. Many of you said CBC. I'll give you CBC reports. And you tell me what the diagnosis is. What is this? Hemoglobin is normal, total count high, high polymorphs, lymphocytes naturally low, eosinophil zero, platelets normal. What is the disease? Acute bacterial infection. Very good. Now look at this second. Almost same. Hemoglobin normal, total count high, poly is high, eosinophil is normal, platelets high. Small difference. Inflammatory disease. Excellent. Excellent. Systemic inflammatory disease. <clears throat> what do you learn out of this? Of course, no CBC should be evaluated without the clinical story. That is very certain. But many times we are impressed by those polymorph lymphocytes. And here you will see that better indicators of a problem are not polys or lymphos, but eosinophils and platelets. What is the difference between acute bacterial infection and systemic inflammatory disease? Eosinophils are zero in acute bacterial as well as acute viral infection. Okay. And in all other acute conditions, the eosinophils are not zero. Of course, the problem is today CBC is done by automated counter. 
and most of the laboratories, almost all, have a type of a automation where the automation can only differentiate polys, lymphos, and others. Others include eosinophils, monocytes, basophils. And the pathologist has to see the smear and assign the numbers. Of course, the latest generation of automation has also ability to pick up eosinophils, etc. But the point is, acute bacterial and acute viral infections are eosinophils zero. And on all other fever, eosinophils are not zero. And this is because an acute infection is an acute in cell. The steroids are pulled out. The, much before that, the, there is a suppression of adrenals and therefore the eosinophils go. So that is a good sign. Problem is half of our population is allergic. So eosinophils are already 10 and 10 becomes 4, it's called normal. So you will again go by the clinical thing. Let's see, what is this? Again, polymorphs, leukocytes, but not as high as first. Eosinophil zero, platelets are low. What is this? Acute viral infection. Important of platelets and eosinophil. Eosinophil zero, platelets low. Acute viral infection. Don't go by polys and lymphos. Okay, when polys are high, the lymphos have to be low and vice versa. Hemoglobin, double count zero. Less. Lymphos are small. Lymphos zero. Platelets low. What is this? Enteric fever. Wonderful. Look at this. Acute bacterial infection, typhoid, even then leukopenia, lymphocytosis, thrombocytopenia, and eosinopenia. Okay. How important it is to look at all that. Normal hemoglobin, almost normal count, plus minus, plus minus. What do you think it is? So chronic, not interpretive. Okay. Maybe TB, maybe, but no diagnosis. Any chronic condition, even partially treated bacterial infection would look like that. So no interpretation at all. Hemoglobin is low. Total count is plus minus, polymorphs plus minus. Lymphocyte plus minus, eosinophil normal or to increase, platelets are low. What is this? Malaria. Excellent. You are so good. And the next one, hemoglobin low, total count is high. All lymphocytes. Eosinophil normal, platelets are low. Now, now you don't speak. Excellent. Acute leukemia. <clears throat> Okay, fine. And now, hemoglobin is high. Total count, just yes, no lymphocytes. Platelets are low. What is this? This is dengue with hemoconcentration. Okay. But again, we will not diagnose by counts. This was just to show that counts may look similar and still their ultimate diagnosis may be totally different, right? So take a note of that. We'll end up with a take-home message. Provisional diagnosis of fever is possible by day three, day four, but even on day one, you start suspecting. On day two, you are nearly sure. On day three, you have made a final diagnosis. How? Without even going to the laboratory, mostly. And I think that is important. Rule out seriousness. Just the difference between acute bacterial infection and other. Your first impression is, is it bacterial infection or no? Because do I need an antibiotic or no? That's it. If it is no, wait and see what happens. Nobody is likely to die. So you take a note of that. And that is the way. In case of suspected acute bacterial infection, could you choose an antibiotic? If infection is above diaphragm, gram positive, infection below diaphragm, gram negative, simple. Mostly amoxicillin, okay, or more beef suffixin today, fine. You don't need many antibiotics to know, okay. You'll be surprised that even I don't know many newer antibiotics. 
and I read it only when I see a prolonged fever where they said, sir, even meropenem is given. Then I go to the book and say, what is this meropenem? You need only two or three antibiotics, common antibiotics. Okay. And I think that is where it is. Ensure proper dose and counsel. The most important part of our medicine is document what you are doing and counsel. Explain the people why you are doing that. If you document and explain, even if you are wrong, court will not punish you. Because you have done your job. Medicine is uncertain. Nobody can diagnose correctly. But when you are not, yesterday's time said that one of the pediatricians from Thane has been fined 11 lakhs. Okay, the National Commission, they went up to National Commission. Whatever the fault or no fault, but the court said that he has not documented what he did. And the court said that if you do not document, then you have not done it. How important it is. He has been fined 11 lakhs of rupees. Okay, he might have done well, but he says he did well. Court says, where is the documentation? No documentation. It's so important. Okay, we can make a mistake, but document it. Documentation means you are honest and you have tried your best. Court only wants that. Court doesn't expect you to be right, right? Thank you very much. Uh, hello, hello. If there are any questions coming from some of our centers, then of course we will take them uh, as per the time that you have. Yeah. Sir, something on methanemic acid. Sir? Sir, something on methanemic acid should be used in fewer or not? Pardon? Methanemic acid. <clears throat> See, why I do I know antibiotic antibiotic chemistry? Because you are not getting results from paracetamol. Why you are not getting paracetamol? You did not know when to give. Methanemic acid came as an anti-inflammatory. But it also worked as an antibiotic. What is the what is the problem with methanemic acid? It is much more powerful than paracetamol. But I don't want powerful. I want fever to continue. I said fever is different. Why do you want powerful? I want only to get rid of any discomfort. I want the mild antipyretic. But everybody wanted powerful. And we have seen in the days when methanemic acid was available and often used that a patient did not have fever, but he was in shock and he died. And they said, Nee, Bukhar to achha ho gaya tha. Doctor ka dawa kaam karta tha. Kya ho gaya pata nahi. If suddenly, difficult to believe, me and my clinic, we four pediatrician work together, we have never used anything other than paracetamol at all. And we have never had a problem. In fact, we have taught the parents every time when to use it. And I had a mother who came on day seven to me. He said, sir, seven days ago, you have to do it. I said, what are you doing? No, you have to say, if you have to do it, you have to play it. I said, no. I have to tell you, I have to wait for four days. You have to wait for seven days. Of course, if you have to wait for seven days, it was a viral infection going on for a long time. But sometimes, our telling them, make them even go higher in their own way. So that's why no need of anything. Any, any questions from any questions? Sir, good evening, sir. Sir, nowadays uh, we are coming across, means across, uh, there are small kids, as you said, sir, fevers are not subsiding uh, in four, five days, five, six days. So sometimes we take the opinion of the pediatrician and nowadays pediatrician prescribing the antiviral drugs like Ulsaltamir. So what is the role, means how <laughs> uh, are we, means is it very much beneficial or we are reducing the immunity of the kids or, Miss, is it safe to use Olsaltamavir? Antivirals are not against all viruses. That's number one. You need to know what virus you are dealing with. And therefore, if you are dealing with COVID, Olsaltamavir will not work. Okay. Number two is that it works best in the first 24 hours when you don't know what it is. Thereafter, it takes its own course. And third thing that has happened thereafter, you are right. Everybody does it. 
that very soon it will not work against even the virus against which it should work because the resistance will start coming in. Personally, I thought that in clinical practice, if I don't know which virus on day one, or I don't know at any time, then I should not just use it blindly. But yes, today there is an influence, almost you're seeing H3N2, whatever, okay. You may not be wrong if you pick them up on day one, but day one is difficult to pick up. Thereafter, because you want to give something, yes, but while doing that, we could develop much drug resistance and cause more trouble. So we need to look at that. See, as a practitioner, I want to get my patient well. What happens to the community thereafter is not my problem, which is not right. Suppose you throw the dirt out of your window into the compound, the germs that will arise will come back to your home also. So you are not keeping your room clean and safe by putting something out. That is a joint responsibility of the community. But you are right. See, I am not saying that as pediatrician we do something great. No, even I may not be doing great. But every time I think whether what I am doing is right or wrong, even if I think, I will possibly improve. As I said that we improve only because we think. Even when I think, oh, I have been always wrong, I may start getting better only if I think that was the thing, right? Yeah. yeah. Any more questions? Sir, on day. Somebody is there? Yeah. Somebody want to ask? No. Yeah, yeah. On day three or day four, if we are not understanding about the fever, on this day we have to go for at least CBC. I think if on day four you have no diagnosis and you have not given any drug so far, you are almost sure that it's not going to be a bacterial infection by and large. Okay, by and large. Because some bacterial infection may not have obvious symptoms, accompanying symptoms. One of them is a pyelonephritis. Okay, maybe lower urinary tract infection, but there would be some symptoms when you ask upfront. Is there any urgency? Is there any frequency? Is there any loin pain? Or is he looking sick? You get something, but the parents may not come out with, patients may not come out with. But there are infections that I have not taken care of because they are not so common day to day. Which are those? Leptospirosis, rickettsia, brucellosis. Yes. But they are bacterial infections. And therefore, if you diagnose them as bacterial infection and you don't have pneumonia, meningitis, UTI, bacillary dysentery, lymphadenitis, tonsillitis, common, then you think of other bacterial or spirochetal infections. Okay. So, I have not touched that because I wanted to take care of the most common. Yes, I do see sometimes now leptospira, rickettsia, but they are all come in the group of acute bacterial infections. And if you suspect acute bacterial infection, you must diagnose the proper cause because leptospira or rickettsia may need not the usual antibiotics, but might need something different. Okay. So you need to choose the antibiotic according to a diagnosis. My whole idea in the short period of time is to address your issues that your first job is, is the patient serious? Next job is, is he likely to have a bacterial infection? If bacterial infection, mostly common bacterial infection, above the diaphragm, amoxicillin, below the diaphragm, cefixin. That's all. But yes, leptospira, rickettsia, brucella, all these exist even today, but they are not as common, right? So, sir, we, uh, we also have uh, 11 teams who are joining from the different sure, locations. Sure. So we'll take one by one their questions. So first, Raipur team, if you have any questions, please ask. Raipur team. So anyone from Raipur team, if you, if they have any questions, please ask. Okay, so we'll go to next one. That is now. Question have any question can ask. Just unmute yourself. 
नासिक टीम हेलो हेलो यस सर यस सर जस्ट अ मिनट सर सर 1 मिनट फ्रॉम नासिक यस यस प्लीज सर समथिंग सेड फॉर निमोसिलाइड ड्रग हेलो सर निमोसिलाइड ही इज आस्किंग अबाउट निमोसिलाइड यस ही अबाउट द निमोसिलाइड ड्रग आस्किंग मी फॉर निमोसिलाइड ही वांट्स टू से समथिंग अबाउट दिस i think i have made it clear that paracetamol is the antipyretic forget nimesolide nimesolide is out of question it is a crime yeah 100 i mean it okay, okay. so don't use nimesolide as well even mefenimic acid i objected to some extent it's not a crime ibuprofen is acceptable to me paracetamol is the best and again make a point i am not treating fever i am treating discomfort if any sure, and sure. today ask any child's mother she says bukhar mein bhi khelta hai then why do you want mefenimic acid and nimesolide etc nimesolide is banned in majority of the countries even now it is banned in our country sure, sure. nimesolide is an anti analgesic uh, for nephra for arthritis but not for fever but because not everybody gets arthritis but everybody gets fever so there was a market for nimesolide nimesolide is out of question okay anybody from indoor team if they have any questions they can unmute and ask the question indoor team then gorakhpur anyone from gorakhpur if they have any questions they can just unmute and ask like one doxycycline dose which are it या पुणे फ्रॉम पुणे हेलो यस यस सर गुड इवनिंग सर डोस ऑफ डॉक्सीसाइक्लिन इन पेड्रेटिक्स सर या गो अहेड यस सर वी कैन हियर यू सर कंटिन्यू सर या प्लीज आस्क योर क्वेश्चन यहां से लैपटॉप कम हो रही है सर डोस ऑफ डॉक्सीसाइक्लिन डोस ऑफ डॉक्सीसाइक्लिन इन डोस ऑफ डॉक्सीसाइक्लिन इन्फॉर्मेशन शुड नॉट कम फ्रॉम अ स्पीकर बिकॉज इवन इफ आई सेट बाय द नेक्स्ट मिनिट यू हैव अट ऑन इट so my suggestion is and i used to do it in earlier days as well that the drugs that you don't use commonly you put up their dosages on your desk only that's the best way to do okay the drugs that you use when i went abroad even paracetamol the man will open his cell phone and find out what is the dose i said why don't you know paracetamol dose he said why do you use the brain when the cell phone is there to us not that okay i remember when i went to us and gave some money he gave me a change which was much more than what he should give it to me so i said you have given me more money back he said how how do you know do you have a calculator i said in india we are born with a calculator <laughs> and then he checked he had pushed wrong buttons and giving me more change so i said yes, yes your questions are right but All dosages, best way you keep it on your table. It's not. It's not worth spending money on. I don't remember my wife's cell phone number <laughs> because it's on my thing. Okay, so I I suppose there would be a limit not to remember that, right? Okay, good. So any question from Ahmedabad or Nagpur team? So from any location, if they have any question, please unmute themselves and uh, they can ask the question. Yeah. Who is Hello. this? Hello. Yes, please, sir. Wait. Yes, sir. Sir, say something about drug fever. Drug fever is a diagnosis of exclusion. When somebody has gone to ten people and I am the eleven to come, I must give a different diagnosis. <laughs> okay. Where I tell them, oh, this is a drug fever. Stop all the drugs. And he gets well. He tells the whole community. he knows how to diagnose drug fever <laughs> drug fever you should never discuss largely okay but yes 
I have had occasions where I have stopped the drugs not because I knew it was drug fever, but I did not know what to do. <laughs> and they got well. So they <laughs> thought it was drug fever, but I knew it was the fever of unknown origin to me. So many times, the drugs when you stop, patient gets well, not because drug fever, but because he was to get well, and you stop the drug. Many times when you start the drug, they get well, not because of drug. Sometimes when you stop the drug also, they get well. Drug fever is the diagnosis of exclusion. We should not try to use it, right? So one question to the Nasik team, sir, please. Yes, 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 go ahead. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, good evening. Yeah. How long a patient of viral fever can be waited to be treated on OPD basis? And what are the marker point that to be noted that the patient needs admission immediately? I think as a rule, only three or four days. But I have had an occasion to wait even for a week. And I told you, one of my patient mother also waited for a week. When you go beyond four days, your antenna of having made a mistake does arise. And you have to be so comfortably sure. And one needs a little more confidence, more than experience. OK. I think all this, I hope you become confident. You know, experience is not important. Yes, we go by experience. But you know the definition of experience? Highly experienced person makes the same mistake again and again with increasing confidence. <laughs> That's why when somebody says, sir, you are experienced, I start wondering which mistake I do with increasing confidence. But confident, if on day six, day seven, I have a fever which is non-infective, maybe viral or otherwise, I will tell them I'm not going to use anything till I know where it is. <clears throat> and I think all depends on how you counsel and the way you counsel, the parents feel you are so confident. Confidence must be seen. I tell the parents that when the dark clouds come, don't open an umbrella because it may never rain. Okay. But they will say, but sir, suddenly the rain start coming. I said, no, no, you will have time to open the umbrella. Oh, but sometimes you don't have the time to open the umbrella, then you will get wet. I said, forget you're getting wet. How often you have no time to open an umbrella? The person is bent to start opening the umbrella even without the dark clouds. And today, of course, in Bombay, you can see today in this season, people are opening umbrella not for rain, but even for sun rays. And then they take vitamin D because you don't get it from sun rays. Why do you use the umbrella? Okay, so funny. So I, I don't think... What matters is your confidence and the way you convey confidently. And the best way to convey confidently is your way of talking. Parents know that you are yourself shaky. No, 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 don't worry. Okay. That means don't worry even if it gets bad. I'm not worried. I know one, one patient was going for surgery for the first time in his life. So he told the surgeon, I'm quite nervous. He said, why are you nervous? He said, sir, this is my first surgery. Surgeon said, mine also first surgery. <laughs> I am not worried. So the question is, worry means what? Okay. I think learn to document and be confident. If you are not confident, tell them, I, I need another opinion. I will ask my neighboring family physician. He's senior. Okay. People will thank you for that reference. Because they know that you are honest. Today you have to be honest, and to show honesty, you have to document. Well, good evening, sir. Hello. Yeah. hello, hello. Yes. Good evening, sir. I am from Rajabad. Yeah. My question is: Nowadays, there is a trend of getting uh, this uh, typhoid dot and all IgM, IgG done. But how far it is significant? If IgM is positive, should we go for the treatment or should we wait? And in another case, uh, sometimes there is some connective tissue disorder and we have a low-grade fever. We don't find anything, suppose in rheumatoid, it is a seronegative rheumatoid and we have the fever, low-grade fever. And sometimes we get false positive uh, Vidal test. So how do we differentiate in these things when we are in dilemma? Typhidot is banned. Typhidot is useless. 
just don't do it <laughs> literally okay there is no question at all like tb igm and all are banned by government only typhoid rot is not yet banned by government but we should ban it as far as that connective tissue disorder and low fever is concerned i have already said that lower the fever lower the tissue damage lower the number of cytokines and lesser the worry of losing a patient right away mm. so you can wait and watch diagnosis of connective tissue disorder comes only by waiting and unless the connective tissue is seen to be damaged like the tendons like the muscles like the joints then only you can diagnose it but suppose a typical connective tissue disorder starts with low grade fever for a week at least you know it is not a bacterial infection you will not give an antibiotic and you will ask the parents to wait now the question is sir they don't wait they will go to somewhere else then they will know that that somebody else gave some medicine that never worked so because everybody does it you should not do it okay i think we Thank start you. saying hey, but everybody does it no sir i also do it my colleague dr anand sandile who is no more used to always say that not everything that everybody does you should do and he would say that at one time one of our prime ministers used to be very much against uh, very much in favor of vasectomy so in a small village in haryana there was a vasectomy camp and they were vasectomized many adults and they were almost closing the camp when an old man of 80 came and said sir mera baaki hai so he said aapko kyu chahiye he said nahi nahi sir mujhe bhi karna hai bole kyu aapke liye aapke liye zarur nahi bole nahi ye gaon mein sabko kya hai na abhi any lady gets pregnant they will catch you <laughs> that's the only time you also do 80 year old was at tummy okay so that's the rule right you can ask your question in the team हेलो फ्रॉम इंदौर यस हाँ सर मैं एक क्वेश्चन पूछ रहा था कि अगर प्रेगनेंसी किसी भी ट्राइमेस्टर में अगर पेशेंट को यूटीआई हो रहा है तो क्या टैक्सीमो प्रिस्क्राइब किया जा सकता है और अगर नहीं तो फिर कौन सी सेफेस्ट एंटीबायोटिक रहेगी जो अपन प्रिस्क्राइब कर सकते हैं यूटीआई के लिए देर आर मेनी ऑप्शन फॉर ग्राम निगेटिव ऑर्गेनिज्म quinolones are not ideal because today quinolones are being used for a resistant tb as well so we don't want to fire them up but for a short course i don't think pregnancy is an issue really unless you are in the first trimester when some drug can cause a fetal damage and some organs may not form well otherwise most of these drugs are fairly safe even to a lactating mother or to a pregnant mother but you have an option Uh, you have a cotriamcinol amoxicillin uh, cefixim and also if required a quinolone but to be avoided right well nashik team you can ask your question nashik team hello hello, hello sir yeah hello i am yes. dr patil from nashik i am uh, i want to ask that how we can diagnose the viral nk pictures in first day of fever in pediatric viral what is viral infection viral nk infection sir encephalitis encephalitis yes, yes. So, no i did not discuss encephalitis because if there is any symptom like viral encephalitis comes with fever and in 24 hours he is drowsy he is throwing a convulsion there is no question of your discussing what the diagnosis is okay that's why no we did not. viral if encephalitis no viral encephalitis comes as an acute onset neurological infection and there is no time for you to say what happens in next two days or only paracetamol moment you have an intracranial symptomatology you know viral encephalitis drowsiness convulsions unconsciousness is almost in the first 24 48 hours you will rush him to the hospital then what the treatment is to be given that would be left to the hospital depending on what viral infection you are talking like it's a herpes for example yes you may give an antiviral like an ocyclovir or gancyclovir but that is different we are discussing a common office situation and therefore that becomes a totally a different issue right yeah okay hello thank you hello akpur please can i ask yeah go ahead yes i am dr vadwani from indore sir yeah. 
many a times we find ke some patients are not treated for fever for a long time or one month or two and we find that they are suffering of cox but nowadays there is restrictions that general practitioner cannot treat a cox investigations are normal but clinically if we find ke somebody is having cox we refer to the government hospitals they deny they send back patients to us or anybody that they are not treating for cox so what what can do nowadays it is very difficult situation for the patient and us how can we treat the patient of cox if investigations are normal but clinically he's he's or she is suffering from cox please i think we possibly will have a session on cox i suppose so yes, we will leave it to that but just to make it short what have we learned today we will treat when we know what is the problem okay as much as possible and if we don't know but something is serious we ask somebody else who may know that is the way but yes cough is a different problem coughs are often recurrent coughs are often prolonged and that is the totally different thing today we are largely discussing fever and it's a good idea to know that if we do not know the cause we are possibly fishing in the dark and i don't think there is a need to take such an action at all time and again i have told the parents i don't know the diagnosis but i know how to know it over the next two days and i think if you are honest they will understand if they don't like they will go somewhere else there is no problem but you are not doing wrong right yeah dr sachin uh, we have query from nagpur yes yes Uh, sir, yeah. sir, you gave yeah, an right. excellent presentation and uh, excellent talk, sir. I am practicing for thirty-two years, but today I came to know a few more points. And uh, sir, my question is very simple: in viral, bacterial, and enteric, uh, I think the malaria has been overlooked. Uh, it has been underplayed, though we see lesser patients of malaria. But what should be our approach? Whether we should start anti-malarial if suspected on clinical presentation and examination, or wait for the pathological test like peripheral smear or antigenic test? if you are suspecting malaria <clears throat> today it's not easy to suspect malaria every time if you have a typical malaria which shows that rigors and sudden erratic fever yes in an epidemiology where malaria is common you could start treating but at least do one peripheral smear or today we have also the rapid antigen test for malaria okay three three common infections which you should not treat without investigation are malaria typhoid and tuberculosis because there are a lot of drug resistance coming in all these three conditions and all these three are possibly uh, investigatory confirmative diagnosis is possible malaria is one of those but sometime to see a peripheral smear parasite you need a pathologist who spends time and nobody has time you and me have no time that's why we do quick work pathologists also have no time so they say that parasites are not seen however correlate clinically today every report finally ends up saying correlate clinically that mean that laboratory man is teaching us ki aapka kaam barabar karo mere pe bharosa mat rakho okay yeah so if that is so then with a strong feeling that it's malaria you may try to treat she there is a possibility of clinical diagnosis even without a final evidence but not as an ideal yes sometimes yes and in which case i suggest in local epidemiology should decide but to me vivax always chloroquine elsevieram always artemisinin lumefantrin okay as a rule but go by your epidemiological thing right yeah Yeah, one more query from Nagpur. Yeah. Hello, sir. Good evening. Yeah, go ahead. Hello. No. Yeah. Yes, sir. You can continue, sir. Yeah. From uh, sir, actually, ah, uh, uh, sir, a case था जो actually a uh, thirteen year male boy is uh, suffering from uh, fever from last ten uh, days. um i do blood test everything is normal x ray also normal ultrasound everything is normal only cr uh, esr uh, around 50 15 uh, i i will start antibiotic no response 
बट एक्चुअली मैंने जो है स्ट्रॉइड थ्री डेज डोज दिया जो है उसके बाद पेशेंट रिस्पॉन्स कर दिया फीवर नहीं आया स्ट्रॉइड सर सेफ है फीवर में देने के लिए अगर एंटीबायोटिक्स रिस्पॉन्स नहीं हो रहा है अगर सेफ है तो सर हम स्ट्रॉइड कितने दिन दे सकते हैं और सर अगर स्ट्रॉइड दे रहे हैं तो शायद टीएलसी वगैरह हाई होने का मतलब इंक्रीज होने का चांसेस रहता है सर इसमें तो पेशेंट को क्या कर सकते हैं उसके साथ सी व्हेन टेस्ट सर नेगेटिव यू नो दैट यू हैव नॉट थॉट व्हाट टेस्ट शुड बी ऑलरेडी ओके सो इट्स कॉमन टू से ऑल टेस्ट्स आर नॉर्मल बट दैट मींस यू हैव नॉट डन अ टेस्ट व्हिच वुड बी एब नॉर्मल ओके सो doing routine tests have no meaning if there is a theft you don't start searching the thief all over the city you first go to the site of theft and think who could have been the thief okay and then only zero down and say acha ye servant nikal gaya ye hoga ye baju wala zara taklif deta hai wo hoga then you decide to investigate them the in medicine also you must do the same the more of the tests you do and more normal they are by the time you are doing some trials with drugs you almost can never diagnose a condition and today it's not rare for me to see two months of fever sir several antibiotics have been tried then i said the only one i would use now is stop all the drugs and let the disease flare up and when the disease flares up i will make out like if a thief is hiding you also hide your police people so that he thinks now police have gone and now he will come out that's the only way to go by see specific issues that you all saw cannot be easily answered because we only know roughly yes fever was so low long and the tests were of this kind but yes when there is a prolonged fever and your esr or crp is bang normal that almost tells you there is no inflammation at all that's the only pill possibly you will go that but one thing is sure that more you try more you are likely to get confused and the only option is stop everything and start up fresh right hello sir hello sir yeah hello sir uh, i'm dr jamunkar from nagpur yeah bolo bolo uh, do you prefer a paracetamol suppository see the question is mostly we would use the oral drugs okay but yes there are times when but i have never seen in 55 years of practice any mother telling me that she cannot give this drug to her child she will know how to give it so i don't see any need of of any other route of administration except oral but you can take a choice and you can give a parenteral drug i have no option but how often will you go that okay and it hurts i have gone through surgery myself i know how much it hurts but when you say are kuch nahi myelar hai no 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 everything hurts so possibly use the oral route and that's the best but you can use parenteral as well yes sir so last last 5 5 minutes actually if you have any questions you can ask sir is last 5 minutes hello sir ki pramasik hello yes, is there Once. any role of anti malarial drugs in dengue fever or the fever related with thrombocytopenia most of doctors using uh, anti malarials in dengue fever is there any role of anti malarial only thrombocytopenia doesn't give you any diagnosis thrombocytopenia is seen in typhoid is seen in viral infection is seen in malaria is seen in leukemia so thrombocytopenia is only one additional factor to consider in the light of clinical profile and rest of the cbc sir in dengue so, fever go back again thrombocytopenia is not necessary a diagnosis of malaria and malaria may not have thrombocytopenia but yes commonly thrombocytopenia is malaria but several other infections are also so we won't go by test to decide the therapy right sir should we give anti malaria in dengue fever anti malaria in dengue Yeah, you will teach me. I have not heard. <laughs> hello, hello. Most of doctors using, sir. <laughs> yeah. Any more questions? Hello, hello. Yes, sir. I am Doctor Johan from Saibabad. Yes. Uh, and sir said that if the let let us wait till the disease flares up. 
If a patient is on immunosuppressants and drugs, and his immunity is poor, so how will we assess then? Will the disease flare, or the disease will not flare? Then we have to go uh, clinically, or what should we do in that cases? See, to me, clinical medicine is the beginning. Okay, and I think there is no substitute for it at all. The tests are no substitute whatsoever. The question is how skillful I am, and more than that, how confident I am, and am I ready to write down what I am doing? If these three things are done, I think you are mostly right. Otherwise, you will not give an opinion. When there is no opinion, see how the politician talk about when the channels keep on asking him, "What do you think?" He said, "No, it's subjudice. No, we will not talk. Yeah, because he does not know what to say." And he does not want to hurt anybody. So he said, "No, no, I cannot talk." So the point I want to make is, to me, clinical diagnosis is possible in ninety percent of cases. And when it is not possible, tests are not the solution. So you have to go to that. Don't forget that when CT scan was not there, and even a chest X-ray was not there, people could diagnose many things. No, and if at all, if you see the. Respect for doctors has been going down. Why? Because we are not using our honesty, our integrity, our documentation, and therefore everybody suspects a doctor. Fault is ours. And the best way is to say I don't know. Today, at the end of fifty-five years, when somebody comes to me for second, third opinion, and I say I am not sure. Parents have sometimes said, "Sir, don't be so humble. Tell me what I should do." They don't believe I don't know. Where is the harm in saying I don't know? Okay, at least you know you are all right, and let them go somewhere else. But you are all right. I think we need to know that we don't know everything, right? But we must know and then only act. Otherwise, say I don't know. What is harm in saying I don't know? And lastly. Which doctor is starving in this city, in the country? Any doctor is starving? But I am worried. A patient came here and said, "No, why are you worried?" But the honesty always pays. Not immediately. So we'll sir, uh, sir, one question from Ahmedabad. Hello. Yeah, sir, one question from Ahmedabad. No, I think this that question from Gorakhpur. Hello. Hello. Good evening, sir. Fever with fever with rash like measles and chicken pox. Fever with rash. Measles pox, measles and chicken pox. Chicken pox. See fever with rash. What is more important is many details of rash. One is where did it start? How did it spread? What is the type of rash? Is there a fever that has come? Is there an itching? Is there a peeling? Several things I must know before I know what is the cause of that rash. Fever with rash may not mean anything definitely, but yes. For example, if the child starts with high fever, cold cough, or on day three, day four, rash comes, it's measles. But if the child starts with fever, uh, lymphadenopathy, and a rash on day one, day two, it's possible or well. Okay. If there is a vesicle, it's likely to be a chicken pox or a herpes. So, type of lesion: when did it start? How did it progress? And which day of fever it occurred will decide what is the cause of fever with rash. And I think that would be the subject by itself, right? Yeah, so, we'll we'll take one last question, and that will be over. Yeah. Last question. Hello, last sir. Question. Ah, yes. Uh, sir, uh, how the Koshyarkar uh, diagnosed clinically? And how it is related to heart disease? Clinical diagnosis? No, no, Koshyarkar. How the Koshyarkar diagnosed clinically and how it is related to heart disease? Koshyarkar uh, is almost not uh, seen nowadays. Kawaski, Kawaski, Kawaski disease. Okay. Uh. And Koshyarkar is a different situation. We are talking about fever, uh. but yes, Koshyarkar is a severe protein deficiency yeah. where a person comes with hair changes, mental changes, skin changes, and edema. Really? I have not seen it for last three decades. Okay. And Kawasaki, sir, Kawasaki. Kawasaki, Kawasaki. Kawasaki. Huh. I told you Kawasaki in the first five six days has 
fever with irritability and nothing else. Okay. On day seven, you start seeing skin rash. You start seeing many other symptoms like lymph node, glossitis, stomatitis, conjunctivitis, or purulent. Okay. All that comes little later. Okay. But the important thing is diagnose early. I gave you a typical case, five days of fever and irritability. First, I told you no other symptoms. Then I said no change in the five days. So unlikely bacterial or viral, unlikely immunological, yeah. irritability, possibly Kawasaki or leukemia, okay. rule that out. That's the way so, to go. Uh, how, uh, how it is related to heart disease? Heart disease, heart disease you can't suspect, even cardiologists can't, no, no. echocardiogram. It is Kawasaki related? Kawasaki diagnosis is confirmed by echocardiogram okay. if it shows a coronary dilatation, huh. but coronary dilatation may take time to develop. Okay. And because on first week you did an echo and an echo was normal, huh. you still have not ruled out Kawasaki. So Kawasaki is a clinical diagnosis. And if your echo is normal, you will do another echo after a week again. Okay. And you might find coronaries are getting dilated, but you will not even wait for that. You will give IV, IG as a empirical dose okay. because the risk of a severe illness is very high. So that's one area where you would use an empirical IV, IG. Okay. Thank right? you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. So, thank you so much, sir. That was really an insightful session. Now, I request our AVP, Mr. Rana Bose, to please give a word of thanks. The most I think the extreme knowledge and information which uh, Dr. Amdekar has given us, I think that is something which is beyond uh, our expectation. Thank you, Dr. Khosla as well uh, for being a moderator here. And I thank all the doctors across all the 11 centers for making your valuable time, spending time on knowledge dissemination. In today's world, it is very, very important that you know knowledge is there. And corporates like Alchem, I think it is, we have taken it as a very, very important step throughout the year. Like uh, I'll tell you from on 15th and 16th, we are having a mega ENT program, which consists of almost 300 doctors who are coming to Bombay. Uh, it will be a congregation of all ENT doctors. And then we'll have continuous upgradation through knowledge dissemination, which is very, very important in today's scenario. And the interest I find over 100 participants, a big round of applause to all of you. Big, big round of applause. In Mumbai, we've got 100 participants across the country. In Banaras, we've got around 70 doctors. Uh, in the, I think in MP, we've got around 60 doctors. In today's uh, scenario, you do not have doctors coming in. But, you know, the support which Alchem has got is phenomenal in terms of knowledge. Uh, bank which all of you carrying and you want to spread the knowledge i think the uh, overall topic was very interesting fever which is one of the most commonly uh, faced problem by the medical fraternity two very important products in next gen division one is taximo and one is sumol which is paracetamol i think both are supporting your treatment in fever so I would request all of you to be with Alchem. The brands are known to you. The products are known to you. And Taximo or Sumal have become mega brands today. It is only because doctors like you who've been in this session are who are not able to make it today outside, they have been supporting us continuously. A warm welcome once again. Thank you very, very much. May I all request, uh, may I request uh, the entire uh, doctor to join us for dinner and uh, you know we'll break for cocktail as well at the same time i would uh, thank the entire head office group i think mr vikas uh, mr bhavesh uh, doctor sir uh, the entire medical team of alchem to facilitate this program thank you very very much
and a warm warm which alkem has received this phenomenal thank you so much thank you sir thank you very much sir so on behalf of nasik team also we like to thank you very much for giving your valuable time for attending to this uh, cme sir this will be continuous for the next 6 month every quarterly there will be one session and accordingly the crowd will be invited thank you very much thank you thank you on behalf of nagpur team sir uh, i am thankful to entire doctors attending this program and we will be continuing this program and that interactive cme i hope everybody like it and our brand taximo trust cme we will continue it uh, in in interval of time so definitely i hope this is knowledge and gaining cme thank you doctors for attending the cme and you can join dinner thank you giving out their valuable time and uh, to be present for this uh, uh, wonderful cme and this cme will be continued uh, we will be continuing in the july we will be continuing in the october and subsequently in the month of january also thank you sir are rok ja rok ja